Yay Networks. Welcome to Greg Luganis is Alive, the podcast that challenges what you think you know. I'm your host, Greg Luganis, and yes, I'm alive. And I'm joined by my good friend and manager, Beth Zinman. <laughs> Hello, I'm still amused. I, I don't know if I'm a big child inside, but I'll always be amused by that. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so I'm happy to but be I'm, here. But, but Beth, I mean, it, it was just like every six months, if I'm not in the press, then yeah. I get this message, you know, hey, I got a bet, bet with my friend. Are you dead? I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> let me rest in peace, please. Uh, but, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I just, yes, I, I keep harping on it. So sorry to the listeners. They have to put up with that for a moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, of course, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, so I'm really happy to be here because we just had some crazy travel and I'm so happy to be back home. Honestly, I love you <laughs> and I love seeing you and I love these little adventures and excursions with you, oh, but boy. I'm happy to be home. It was kind of nuts. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, it was crazy because we were in Estonia and that event was Mind Valley University. And it was fascinating, you know, just the, the energy at, uh, of yeah. the people there, you know, it was really incredible. And then going to uh, officiate one of my divers, her wedding, she got married. And so it was great to be a part of that celebration and in Texas and, uh, and then heading off to Japan, uh, Japan for the world championships. Yeah. yeah, the World Aquatic Championships. And it was just fascinating to, it was great to see a lot of the people that I haven't seen in a while, but also to, you know, be an observer and see how these things operate and function. Yeah. You know, from, from the performance of the divers to, you know, just the general organization of yeah. putting on an event that, that size. Yeah. I mean, obviously it was really eye opening for me too. Um, and I, and you learned some stuff from that journey, which I think we should unpack on another episode. Uh, cause I know you already have plans today. Yeah. We got to dig into that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, what is on the agenda today? Well, something that I'm really, really interested in is, um, therapeutic psychedelics. Mm. You know, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's rather controversial, but, uh, I mean, it, it, it's something that I've explored with and, um, you know, done as therapy, uh, you know, and you have a guide or whatever the shaman, I mean, I did, a um, an ayahuasca journey mm -hmm. and it, it was so fascinating, um, just because I, in my life at that time, I was feeling stuck and I didn't know why. Yeah. And so I was questioning, you know, to dig a little bit deeper. And then I did this ayahuasca journey and, uh, you know, with a wonderful shaman. Um, Which fascinates and, me, by the way. I'm still a chicken, but it fascinates me. Yeah, right. But I had this experience and, and that's the only way. It, it's a journey. It is a journey and it's experiential. And so what came up for me in uh, one of the sessions was forgiveness. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it was all surrounding my adoption. Oh, wow. That I was really angry at my biological mother um, because she never held me and I somehow, somehow I knew that. Mm -hmm. And what happened on that journey was I realized she was only 16. Yeah. I mean, that's imagine her position. Right. Yeah. And I, I thought to myself, she could not give me what she so desperately wanted. <laughs> I mean, and, and in that experience, I just wept. I mean, I was sobbing because oh, wow. I realized 
you know, she just wanted to be held. Yeah. And she wanted to be comforted, you know? Yeah. So it was really powerful. Yeah, it sounds like it. And honestly, if I'm being completely honest here, because I'm talking to you and I know however many other people are going to be listening to this, (laughs) right? I've already fessed this up to my kids and done like a lot of work here. But that's part of what scares me, actually, not having the feelings or uncovering the feelings. But Mm. I think because I rely, you know, day to day is like my entrepreneur mode, just like being in control, I'm going to handle it and whatever. Having a breakdown and feeling like, oh, my God, will I ever recover? Like, how far will I break down? You know, so how did that feel like in, in the moment? And how did you kind of incorporate that then into your life? Like, I'm curious. Well, it was, uh, I mean, like I said, it was very experiential. Mm. You know, I really felt it. I mean, I was really like you were there. there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, when I got to a place of love and compassion, you know, in my mind, I, I was able to hold her. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it really opened you to that. That's cool. Right. Yeah. And and the thing is, you don't, you know, not having kind of a preconceived notion of that something's going to happen, you know, <laughs> and, you know, just allowing, um, and like the shaman said, allow uh, the mother um, to do her work, mm. you know, and the thing, the thing about all this is you, you really need to feel like you're in a safe place. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, you you need to feel like you're in a safe place. You're surrounded and supported, you know, by love and compassion. So I think that that is so important. And that's why, you know, speaking today with, uh, you know, pediatric and adult neurologist, Dr. Maya Sheetreat, Dr. Maya is an herbalist, urban farmer, and forager, and ceremonialist. She's also the author of Dirt Cure, and now Master Plant Experience, which we will be talking to her about that today. In addition, Dr. Maya is the creator of Quantum Drops, a sacred plant medicine uh, product that is the, and she's the founder of Terrain Institute, where she offers certification for those who want to work with psychedelics, as well as other services. Cool. We'll be right back with Dr. Maya. Dr. Maya, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. And, um, you know, you've written a couple of books and, uh, and I, you know, I, I love the topic. Now, um, what drew you to, uh, to psychedelics? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I am, um, in my growing up days was when you were an Olympic champion and I am like a little fangirling, my little Gen X is fangirling, getting to, to meet you all these years later. So, um, I just wanted to mention that. (laughs) Thank you. That's so sweet. Um, That's so sweet. So you're telling your age though, by saying that. (laughs) I'm very proud. I'm turning 50 this year and I'm, very proud to be turning 50. I feel like we earn it, you know, we earn right. it. So yeah, I'm, um, I earned every gray hair on my exactly, head. Exactly. Yeah. And every We're wrinkle. Be the elders, right? So yes. you have to own it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love that. Um, so yeah, I, I actually kind of joke that I got involved with psychedelics. Um, I got dragged into it, kicking and screaming kind of, because I originally went, um, to Ecuador not mm-hmm. to study psychedelics um, by ingesting them or anything like that, because but because I wanted to learn with um, indigenous people about their approaches to healing, which are 
you know, many and not just limited to uh, psychedelics or master plants. And right. um, nobody mentioned on this trip that I was doing with this uh, PhD in ethnobotany, who is a fourth generation shaman. Oh, by the way, while we study plants and learn with, you know, indigenous healers, we're also going to throw in some ceremonies <laughs> with, wow. with some psychedelics. So I actually, wow. you no, know, I mean, I was an integrative neurologist. I'm an herbalist. I, I had the conventional, I had the integrative, but I certainly had no expectation, especially I was the mother of young kids at the time. I was not like, oh, let me go off for two weeks to the Amazon to go, um, you know, trip on psychedelics. That was <laughs> not my goal. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I had a journey with uh, San Pedro cactus, among a couple others. Um, and there the doses are actually very small. They're not like the way we think of some of them. But in this, at the end of this journey, I won't get too detailed, but um, I was with kind of the spirit of the plant. And he said, now you're my wife and I'm your husband and we are gonna spread this healing message together. Now, I forgot about that for 10 years, just about, um, didn't really think about it, but then ended up starting to teach about psychedelics, starting to write about psychedelics. And then, you know, here we are. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, and I, I, I love that because this is, this is ancient stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, practices that, you know, it, we, it didn't have that stigma you know, of, oh, you're tripping, you know, that, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. It really is ceremonial and it's a journey. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, we're finding actually, so I do think over the history of time, really, right, we are finding more and more evidence that psychedelic master plants have been fundamental to the human experience. And that I'm even referring to cave drawings that are still today being discovered where they're looking at um, DNA evidence in some cases of actually like detura mm. or mushrooms, the drawings they're finding. I grew up thinking, oh, these cave drawings, right? Like we were taught in, I don't know, fifth grade or something are like, you know, these primitive people drawing their whatever. And I was like, wow, those are ugly. I remember thinking these pictures are strange or whatever. Didn't they know how to draw, right? It turns out these pictures actually were found not like the opening of the caves where mm -hmm you would have light, right? People would be like active and living. No, they were found very, very deep in the cave mm. where it was like complete darkness, lower oxygen. They think they were probably drawn in many cases by women because of the size of like handprints and so on. And there are very many shamanic pictures. It turns out these pictures mm. were either, you know, half man, half animal or pictures of actual mushrooms and other things. So. They are in fact very ancient, but I do think also they weren't just public events that everybody talked about. They were, they were kind of like a little under the radar, I think, and they were for um, in ceremonial ways for initiates, right, um, or for mm -hmm. healings. That's my impression, and I think what we're finding in the kind of archaeology, let's say, and ancient tradition. Yeah, I mean, because it, it does, it goes back so far. And, um, you know, like you said, the, we're still discovering, right? Right. So we're still discovering who should consider using this type of therapy. Hmm. I can talk about it from two different standpoints, because I've done mm -hmm. a lot of study with indigenous teachers. And in that world, it's a little there's a lot of overlap, but it's a little different in how they talk about it from how we talk about it medically. So mm -hmm. from the medical standpoint, um, we're seeing for many mental health issues, and I'm talking like, you know, the difficult to treat, like uh, mm -hmm. refractory depression, where people have tried all the meds and all the approaches and they're still not better, um, PTSD, OCD, eating disorders, addiction um, mm -hmm. have been studied. And um, in many cases, believe it or not, with the right support before, during, and after, okay? And I always say that because that's really all the data comes from that, right? It doesn't mean if you right. go off and, you know, do it out in the woods somewhere, you couldn't experience healing, but we don't have data on that. Let's put it that way. 
Um, right. But with one dose or two doses in certain cases, these are studies that are done at Johns Hopkins, at NYU, and so on. Um, people find reversal or significant mm. reduction in symptoms, like very profound in many cases, smoking, alcohol, right? I mean, really severe where they are absolutely compromised in their lives. Um, and then we're starting to see, even with microdosing, uh, mm -hmm. benefit for people who have inflammation, autoimmunity. So, um, you know, and there's a lot of study here for dementia, Parkinson's, all of these are being studied now. So um, traumatic brain injury is another example and relevant to athletes actually, right? I used to see a lot yeah. of that in my clinical days, um, migraines, pain syndromes. So microdosing, I think it's different. Microdosing is a sub psychedelic dose, meaning you are not gonna trip, right? You're not having that experience of, you know, being out of commission um, and you do it over months, let's say every few days mm -hmm. over months, but people are seeing tremendous benefit. I just actually met somebody yesterday who just stopped me um, because he knew about my book and said, you know, we were microdosing my daughter with Crohn's disease and um, it's the only thing that ever helped her. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's almost, you know, like rewiring, mm -hmm. rewiring your brain and, and, uh, it allows that to happen for healing yeah. because, because, because that that's, that's a big part of, of healing. You know, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, then, you know, you're going to get the same results, but if you can, uh, rewire your brain and, you know, and change your habits and become actually, a, you know, renew your identity, mm -hmm you know, to, to take on a, a, a brand new identity, a lot of those uh, issues, depression, anxiety, Crohn's, you know, can uh, be, you know, less present, you know, or uh, would, would you say cured? Well, I think I would, I would hesitate to say cured right now because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people's um, struggle when it comes to psychedelic outcomes or, or work with master plants is expectations that mm -hmm. aren't met. So I, I'm really careful, I think, and we all should be careful in this nascent stage, uh, nascent for us, not nascent for humanity, um, to not overstate benefits mm -hmm. um, because there are so many amazing benefits without needing to overstate them. But to your point about um, recovering, let's say, which is always a journey, no matter what we're recovering from, right? right. You're, you're kind of always in a sense in recovery because what you're doing is retraining your brain, your body, your physiology, and all of that. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it's literally... <laughs> rewiring your brain. What we know about psychedelics, certainly on a macro level, meaning with the big journey, the big trip that a lot of people would associate with psychedelics, but also probably we're seeing um, in smaller doses, micro and otherwise, um, actual plasticity in the brain in adults. Now, when I was in my training, and I mean, I'm not that old, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> yesterday either, but not that long ago in my neurology training, it was thought, uh, you know, adults don't have plasticity. We don't make new connections in our brains. And, you know, our brains aren't always growing and changing. It was sort of depressing, right? Like kids have a lot of plasticity. And then at a certain point, like that's where it all stops and everything's downhill from there. But in fact, that's right. absolutely not true. We know there are a lot of ways that our brain has plasticity over our lives, even just by learning new things, right? As we age. But in addition mm -hmm. to that, um, we're finding microdosing, macrodosing, and you know these master plants literally create um, new connections. And I'll give you an example, just because it's kind of cool. So, people with depression are found to have fewer connections between their neurons, literally fewer synapses. Like, like their actual neurons become lonely. If you could think about it that way. Wow. And when they uh, experience psychedelics these same neurons are shown to then 
create new connections. They become more connected, more social, you know, and in greater exchange and community. It's, it's so beautiful because it's this like ancient concept of like, so within as without, you know, that type of idea. And it's really mm -hmm. mirrored in ourselves, the conditions that we have. And so um, that's true for neurons. And it's also true for different parts of the brain in a psychedelic experience, parts of the brain that normally don't communicate communicate with one another. So to your point of having new eyes, right? Having a new way of seeing things. And there's a lot of cool neuroscience around this. Um, like, you know, what shuts down during a psychedelic journey and how that kind of opens up the possibility for us to see things fresh. Um, that actually allows us to create new patterns and see things not the way we've seen them always. Um, mm -hmm. We want that, right? We want the wisdom of our experience, but we don't want to be stuck in trauma. For example, if our experience was not always great, we don't want to come into each new situation assuming in some unconscious way that it's also not going to be great. And so how do we change that way of seeing psychedelics mm -hmm. are one way that we actually shut down parts of our brain that fill in the details from the past so that we are very much living in the present moment with brand new eyes. Yeah, I mean, it, because, I mean, so many people live in their trauma. Mm -hmm. They live in the, that, I mean, that is a place that they know, they're comfortable, they're familiar with it you know, and to make those new connections. Do you find that uh, we're on a path of embracing psychedelics as far as treatment and, and in, in healing? Well, it depends on who you mean by we. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I understand the, the we can be a little cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> well, because so. we're, we're not like, you know, we're not uh, like a uniform kind of community, as we well know, or since the past few years, we know it even more. But, um, you know, I find younger people, so let's mm -hmm. say like millennials and below, and some Gen Xers, if I'll talk about this generationally, psychedelics are like, yeah, so what, right? Like it's so, it's not like a question, it's not a concern, but for people who are in the boomer generation and some of the older Gen Xers, there's a lot of stigma that was programmed into us over the course of our early lives. You know, I mean, it was uh, absolutely illegal, a felony and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, we can talk a little bit about why that is um, if you want, but, it's really difficult for some people to um, kind of extract themselves from that way of seeing things, not just because they're prejudiced, but maybe in the 60s, they saw their friends go through really terrible experiences when it was kind of a free for all and not really supported or well understood. So there is that. I think in the medical community, um, there's interest, but with a lot of caution. And the reason that could be is because doctors are, well, doctors are cautious people. We're trained to be cautious in many, many ways. Um, and I am cautious, despite the fact that I talk about things that are a little different. Um, I'm also a cautious person, but also doctors like to know what, an, what if they're giving a drug, and these are very far from, in my mind, pharmaceuticals or drugs, but, um, right. but, when they're giving a treatment of any kind, they want to have a pretty clear sense of exactly what's going to happen. And the nature of a macro dose of a trip with a psychedelic is that you have absolutely no idea what will unfold. You just have to kind of support the person, keep them safe and allow them to go through maybe what could be a very uncomfortable experience right. for many people is a very uncomfortable experience, particularly maybe the first or second time they ever engage. So right. doctors, I think are very cautious, but I mean, you know, I have a community of people who, you know, take my programs and so on who are, you know, which are tens of thousands of people who are very excited about it and very interested in learning. So I feel hopeful. That's yeah, that's awesome. Because 
you know, in treating my, my depression, uh, you know, I went through, you know, the series of Wellbutrin, the tried Prozac and all of this stuff. But oftentimes, you know, the side effects of those pharmaceuticals is just really, you know, it's, 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 it's more than, than you really anticipate, you know? And so, um, to have a more natural approach and, uh, you know, it just, for me, it makes sense. Um, yeah, you know, not having those side effects and, um, now does insurance embrace this or is this not recognized? So, um, <clears throat> Basically, because in a lot of places in the U.S., let's say, um, and in the world, these are still illegal. Mm. Um, they are not covered by insurance. And, um, and furthermore, right, so then there are areas where there are, uh, where it's decriminalized, certain cities, let's say, in the United States or in the state of Oregon. Um, mm. And in those places decriminalization does not mean legal, but it means it's on the lowest priority list for law enforcement, um, mm -hmm. as long as it's not a big amount, right? Like they don't want people, I guess, dealing or things like that. Right, um, right. But that said, uh, still, it wouldn't be covered by insurance in a place like that. And so in Oregon right now, it's sort of like the test state where um, they're looking at how to offer these in a therapeutic way with the right approach and the right set and the right setting and so on. And they're looking at the prices that are being, at least what I've read so far, as being something between three and $5,000 for an experience. Um, not as far as I have seen so far covered by insurance, hence really out of range for actually probably many of the people who need it most. Um, right. Right. And especially if we think about the wisdom holders, the people who have traditionally been the keepers of this, right? Like indigenous people and so on, mm -hmm. um, you know, many of those people would not be able to access this. So uh, it's the usual, you know, I guess capitalist conundrum, if I can say it like that, which is, yeah. you know, and our healthcare system, I mean, it's funny. Um, not to get, you know, not to digress too much, but I was interviewing someone in Europe for an event mm -hmm. I was doing on psychedelics. And he basically very offhandedly said, yeah, but in your country, you know, obviously it's just so terrible. I don't know how you can expect to treat anything um, because you know, nobody really gets good care. And I was like, the way he said it, as if it was so obvious, I was like, okay, stop. We need to unpack this because we're so you know, we're so used to it here, we don't even realize it in the rest of the world. Not to say psychedelics are being offered all over the world, they're not right. yet. But once they are, which is likely to be the case, uh, because we are having a lot of clinical studies, and you know, the more and more and more scientific literature is coming out, literally, weekly, if not daily, I see new, really interesting, promising studies. Um, mm -hmm you know, in the rest of the world, it's going to be a lot more accessible than it will be here in the U S because our insurance system is really rigged and challenging and unfair. My conversation with Dr. Maya was so good. We had to make it into two parts. So come back next week and hear the rest of our conversation. Namaste. Yay Networks.